Hello, I am Mark Chaplow from the University of Iowa and the Veterans Affairs Medical Center in Iowa City, Iowa. I want to share with you the exciting results presented at our symposium titled Contributions of Skeletal Muscle Myopathy to Heart Failure, Novel Mechanisms and Therapies. The symposium was held at the IUPS Congress in Birmingham, UK in July 2013. The goals of the symposium were to review and discuss recent advances on this topic with emphasis on cellular molecular mechanisms and integrative pathophysiology and to facilitate translation of basic science discoveries to patient care. The speakers included basic scientists and clinicians with diverse expertise in skeletal muscle biology, cardiovascular physiology, autonomic regulation, exercise science, genetics, and clinical cardiology. Results obtained from patients and animal models were presented and discussed. I am pleased to announce that symposium reports based on each of the five presentations are now published in the April issue of Experimental Physiology. Let's begin with some background. Heart failure often results from intrinsic cardiac dysfunction, which may be acquired, for example, after myocardial infarction, and or be genetically based. The fundamental mechanisms and gene mutations that affect cardiac function often also influence vascular smooth muscle and skeletal muscle as well. Hypercontractile vascular muscle can lead to ischemia, not only in peripheral tissues, but also in the heart where coronary vasoconstriction can cause or worsen ischemia and lead to cardiomyopathy. While cardiac dysfunction is of course at the heart of the problem in patients with heart failure, it is widely appreciated that abnormalities in other organ systems contribute to development and progression of this fatal disease. One such system is skeletal muscle. Chronic decreases in skeletal muscle blood flow, i.e. ischemia, that can occur after cardiac insults and or intrinsic abnormalities in skeletal muscle, as occur in inherited muscular dystrophies, may lead to skeletal muscle myopathy, the central focus of our symposium. The five symposium reports address a variety of abnormalities in skeletal muscle that contribute to myopathy in several unique animal models and in patients with heart failure. These abnormalities include activation of the skeletal muscle renin-angiotensin system, or RAS, oxidative stress, fibrosis, inflammation, increased proteolysis, and loss of muscle mass. Oxidative stress and disruption of membrane-targeted nitric oxide synthase in skeletal muscle impair sympatholysis, which results in exaggerated sympathetic-mediated vasoconstriction and in contracting muscle during exercise. The resulting ischemia and other myopathic pathologies contribute to skeletal muscle weakness, fatigue, and exercise intolerance in heart failure. It is important to appreciate the importance of weakening of respiratory muscles, such as the diaphragm, in heart failure. Respiratory muscle weakness and fatigue increase the work of breathing and may decrease ventilation, resulting in hypoxemia, acidosis, and increases in pulmonary artery pressure, the latter being a major determinant of right ventricular afterload. Thus, respiratory muscle weakness can contribute to inadequate oxygen delivery to peripheral tissues and increased cardiac work. Clearly, genetics and environment each contribute to both skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle myopathies and dysfunction. It is important to consider gene-environmental interactions. Phenotypes can vary greatly, even in diseases arising from a single gene mutation. The variations may reflect genetic modifiers as well as environmental influences. In their report, Kayleigh Swaggart and Beth McNally identify genetic modifiers that contribute to variations in pathology and function in a model of limb girdle muscular dystrophy type 2C, the sarcoglycan gamma deficient mouse. These mice develop cardiac as well as skeletal muscle myopathy and dysfunction. Extrapolation of some of the results to different types of muscular dystrophy in patients is discussed by the authors. Examples of modifying genes that differentially affect limb skeletal muscles versus respiratory muscles versus heart are also highlighted. Physical activity level is an important environmental factor. While physical exercise can impose considerable cardiovascular risk in patients in heart failure, aerobic exercise training can provide impressive results. Numerous positive effects of exercise have been demonstrated, including those affecting cardiac, vascular, skeletal muscle, and autonomic nervous system functions. In their report, 
Patricia Brum and colleagues described the hallmarks of skeletal muscle myopathy in two animal models of heart failure, coronary ligation-induced myocardial infarction in rats and hyperadrenergic mice deficient in alpha-2A and alpha-2C adrenergic receptors. Beneficial effects of exercise training on myopathic features in skeletal muscle are described in both of these animal models and in patients with heart failure. Mechanisms underlying exercise-induced decreases in oxidative stress and proteasome activity and increases in protein synthesis and muscle mass are highlighted. In their report, Evgeny Ivakin and Ronnie Cohn summarize results of studies investigating the molecular determinants of skeletal muscle atrophy, a major clinical problem in a variety of pathological states and conditions, including heart failure. They make use of the hibernating 13-line ground squirrel, a species that is able to maintain muscle mass despite prolonged periods of inactivity and lack of food intake. The results reveal that serum and glucocorticoid regulated kinase 1, or SGK1, is upregulated during hibernation and contributes to preservation of muscle mass via inhibition of proteolysis and autophagy and stimulation of protein synthesis. Furthermore, immobilization-induced atrophy was enhanced in SGK1-deficient mice and rescued by SGK1 overexpression. Thus, SGK1 is a novel therapeutic target that is deserving of study in models of heart failure. Neurohumoral mechanisms also play key roles in heart failure. Neurohumoral activation becomes maladaptive during chronic pathological states like heart failure, for example, chronic activation of the sympathetic and renin-angiotensin-aldosterone systems damage cardiac muscle and increase cardiac afterload and extracellular fluid volume. Furthermore, sympathovagal imbalance increases risk of arrhythmias and sudden cardiac death. The chronic neurohumoral activation results in large part from increases in sensory nerve activity from skeletal muscle, heart, kidneys, and arterial chemoreceptors. The excessive sensory nerve activity from ischemic myopathic skeletal muscle is of particular relevance to today's topic. Massimo Pipoli and Antonio Crisofulli review in their report the evidence that activation of sensory nerves in contracting skeletal muscle reflexively increase sympathetic activity and blood pressure in humans and that this exercise pressor reflex is enhanced in patients with chronic heart failure with the increase in blood pressure resulting primarily from increased vascular resistance instead of cardiac output, which is the major contributor to the pressor response in healthy subjects. Deleterious consequences of the abnormal exercise pressor reflex in heart failure include excessive neurohumoral activation, muscle ischemia and fatigue, dyspnea, and exercise intolerance. The increased activity of sensory nerves in skeletal muscle not only provides a link between skeletal muscle myopathy and neurohumoral activation, but creates a positive feedback loop with potential to further worsen the myopathy via activation of the sympathetic and renin-angiotensin systems. Rasna Saberwal and I report in our review that sarcoglycan delta deficient mice, a model of limb girdle muscular dystrophy type 2F, exhibits severe autonomic dysregulation, including increased cardiac and sympathetic vaso sympathetic tone and associated with skeletal muscle myopathy and decreased locomotor activity at a young age, well before development of cardiomyopathy. The abnormalities are accompanied by activation of the renin-angiotensin system and are abrogated by chronic treatment of sarcoglycan-deficient mice with either the angiotensin AT1 receptor blocker Losartan or the protective angiotensin peptide ANG1-7. The results encourage therapeutic targeting of the renin-angiotensin system and autonomic dysregulation in early stages of muscular dystrophy to limit or delay disease progression. To sum up, there is no doubt that skeletal muscle myopathy contributes to pathogenesis, symptoms, and clinical outcomes in heart failure. I believe the results presented in these symposium reports are sure to stimulate further investigation of mechanisms underlying the myopathy and development of new strategies to therapeutically target skeletal muscle myopathy and its consequences in patients with heart failure. I hope you enjoy reading the reports. <music>